On behalf of the Minister of the Congregation, the Reverend John Gray, at this session, I want to bid everyone a very warm welcome in the Saviour's name. Not only those who've been able to gather here personally, but also those who are listening in. And we trust that the God of all grace and comfort today will come amongst us in a very special way, uh, that we may know His help and His blessing and His presence. We're going to bow together, open our service with a word of prayer. Our loving God and our eternal Heavenly Father, we come again into Thy holy presence, and we come through that name which is above every name, the name of Thy Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank Thee this day that we can call upon Thee that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We come, our Father, to give You thanks for Thyself and for all that You have done for us in the person of the Lord Jesus. We give You thanks for Thyself, Thy wonderful work in creation, speaking this world into existence and starting its beginning. We give You thanks for Thy wonderful work in redemption, the giving of Thy Son to be our Savior. And we rejoice that He who was the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world came forth in the fullness of time, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, went out to Calvary's cross, laid down His life, shed His blood, the ransom price of all our sin. But we rejoice today that the grave could not hold Him, but that He rose again, now has ascended up on high, making intercession for His people. And our Father, we thank You that as we gather here, there is one in the glory who pleads our cause. And so we earnestly pray for Thy blessing, Thy divine intervention, and for the help of Thy Holy Spirit. As we gather here today, we pray that You'll bless each one that has come and those who are listening in. And you, you know the needs of our hearts. We pray especially today for those who are laid aside, your hand of divine healing and mercy will be upon them. Those who mourn at this time, that they may be comforted. We think especially, Lord, of those who have been bereft of loved ones very, very recently. We think of Joan Cairns today. We think of her son Frank, his wife and children, on the passing of Dr. Cairns. And our Father, we give you thanks for his life, his work, his testimony. Uh, for the multitude of gifts you give to him, for his mighty work done amongst us as a denomination, and for his wider ministry that touched the hearts of so many. And we rejoice in the assurance that he is now with thyself. And our Father, help us each one in these days to cast our care upon thee, to acknowledge thee in everything that you might direct our path, to prove the sufficiency of your grace in all things, and to know that round about are the everlasting arms. We pray, Lord, that you bless the preaching of thy word in this province today, that many on hearing thy truth will close in with your offer of mercy, and that you will also edify the body of Christ, build us up in our most holy faith. So, our Father, we just commend ourselves to you now and ask for your blessing and your help while we pray in our Savior's name. Amen. We're going to take our Bible reading at this stage, and we're turning to the Gospel of Mark. Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, and we will break into the chapter at the verse 35. It had been an extremely busy day for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we come to verse 35, he is now addressing his disciples. And the same day when even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, he took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. 
And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Amen. God again will add his blessing to the public reading of his precious word. Eric Patterson, and we would express our sympathy on behalf of the minister in session and congregation here to Eric, who lost a brother on Friday. So please remember Eric in your prayers, and also Nigel and Karen and the family and the wider family circle at this time. And also, uh, just uh, many of you are on the, the prayer chain group anyway, so you see the prayer requests coming through. And I'm not going to go through a list of names this morning because we know there, there are many people who have contracted COVID and are unwell, and there's others who are in hospital at this time with other ailments. So please continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, even as they're suffering at this time and in various ways. Please remember them in your prayers. I can ask you to remember tonight the service at 6.30. Uh, and please remember, if you can, make it to the time of prayer before that meeting. And at 6.30 this evening, we will be having uh, the short act of remembrance, so please remember that. Again, in God's will, the preacher will be Mr. Morrow, and the singer will be Anna Farrell. And then for the incoming week, Tuesday night at 8, in the church here will be the prayer meeting, and the Reverend Gray, in God's will, will be here and continue his series in the life and times of Samson. Uh, Thursday night, there will be a committee meeting at 8 o'clock here um, with a short session meeting after the committee meeting, so please remember that, man. Friday night, please remember Young People Youth Fellowship at 8 p.m. And then next Lord's Day, we'll have uh, Sunday school and Bible classes at 10.30 at the normal time, and then our services at 11.30 and 6.30. And the preacher uh, next Lord's Day will be our own minister, the Reverend Gray, in the morning, the singer will be Miss, Mrs. Colette Denny, and in the evening service, it'll be Mrs. Ruth McRoberts. I can also just ask you to remember that, obviously, we're not lifting collections in the church at the moment, but there is the basket at the door um, for your collection on the way out of the services today. And just finally, again, as we probably do every week, we'd like to thank you for following the instructions of the stewards as you enter and leave the building. And we encourage you to keep doing that. Um, we know that the virus is being transmitted widely in the wider community at this time. And we just encourage you again to remember uh, and to try and maintain those guidelines that the government have given, particularly around social distancing. So when you're coming in and you're going out of the building and even out there in the car park, just please keep your distance uh, and, and we'll try and keep each other safe as best as we can. That's all of the announcements I'll hand back to the Reverend Morrow. And I'd like to say today that it's a joy and a privilege to be here, and I say that sincerely. I trust the Lord will bless our coming together in a special way. You know, folks, we are living in very difficult days. And our world probably will never, ever be the same again. You talk about the new norm and all the rest of it, and that is probably true. And of course, the seriousness of our situation even has been reinforced to us over the passing of Dr. Cairns. And I think everyone in our congregations and the wider Christian circle owes a lot uh, to Mr. Cairns. Certainly, all of our ministers, especially those who uh, sat under his teaching in theology. We may not always have appreciated it because, I mean, theology to him was like other people drinking a cup of tea, uh, but it wasn't that always to some of us as you struggled through it. But certainly he was a man of God, one who affected all our lives, one who touched all our lives, and I do trust today that his good wife and family will know God's grace in a particular way at this time. 
Folks, we're going to bow together for prayer, and then we're going to come to God's Word. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today for those whom you raised up, who were an influence in our lives to live for Thee. We pray, Lord, that you will help us today in the proclamation of Thy Word, that you'll write its truth upon our hearts. Remember Mrs. Mr. Gray today, and Mrs. Gray as well. We commit them prayerfully to Thee and ask that you'll bless them at this time, help them, and encourage them. And we ask, Lord, that you'll give us a hearing ear today and an understanding heart of wisdom, that we might rightly divide the Scriptures. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you please to open your Bible again with me at Mark's Gospel and the chapter 4. We're going to take as our text the very first verse that we read together, the verse 35. And there it says, The same day when even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. Let us pass over unto the other side. The theme of our message this morning is the Savior of every situation. And no matter how you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to conclude that He is the Savior, He is the Master of every situation. Had we taken time to read all of the chapter, you would have seen that the events recorded there show us that this had been a very, very long day in the earthly life and public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. The events of that day, of course, begin in the previous chapter, Mark chapter 3. And of course, there was a controversy had arisen, and that because the Lord Jesus Christ had healed a man on the Sabbath day. Therefore, there was a confrontation with him by the Pharisees, insomuch that his family and his friends were concerned. And they actually tried to, if I might put it this way, kidnap the Savior out of the situation. Because the Bible tells us concerning that very thing, that they came to him and they sought to take him away. Now, Jesus, of course, that same day was teaching the people in parables. And after that, then he had spent some time with his disciples explaining to them concerning the message in the parables. Also, during that day, the Lord Jesus Christ had sat in a little boat just off the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He had used that boat, of course, as a pulpit, and a great multitude of people had assembled around him, and he taught them his word. Now, when the day was over, because in the verse 1 it says, he began to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into his ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. Then at the end of it all, the Lord tells his disciples, as our text says, to go over unto the other side. Now, while they were sailing to the other side, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ, and probably because of the busyness of the day and the weariness, he fell asleep in the vessel. I believe that this story is one of the clearest pictures in the Gospels concerning the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Being tempted in all points, of course, like as we are, you and I can thank God today that the Lord Jesus Christ understands our weakness. He's able to sympathize with us in every situation, even in our weariness. The psalmist said this in Psalm 103, for he knoweth our freedom. 
he remembers that we are but dust. Now, of course, you'll understand that most of the disciples of the Lord had been used to the Sea of Galilee and had been used to the Sea of Galilee at night. After all, most of them were experienced fishermen. But an event would occur that night that would change the life of those men and would change their perception of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that for all time. What happened that night proved to those disciples, and of course proves to you and to me as well, that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He's Savior of every situation. He's Master of every situation. And they demonstrate that He is the Master of every situation. That night, in that storm, the disciples found themselves in the battle of their lives. And there they had experienced the Lord's power. And the good thing is this, folks. They lived to tell the tale. So we can learn from their experience that night on the Sea of Galilee in the midst of the storm when the Savior seems to be uninterested and sound asleep. Of course, there's a sense in which all of us are on a journey. All of God's people are sailing towards the unseen port of heaven. And as we sail, we need to be absolutely clear of this fact that storms will arise and situations will come and will almost threaten our very existence that we feel we're sinking beyond hope. Like the disciples, we often think that some of our situations will destroy us forever. But we need to know this and learn it from the disciples, their experience with the Lord Jesus Christ here that your storms and mine are not sent to destroy us. They are sent to strengthen us and to give us a greater perception of who the Lord Jesus Christ really is. That phrase, let us pass over, unto the other side, in that the Lord Jesus Christ said that if the disciples had let that sink into their heart, there would never, ever have be needed to be a moment of hesitation or doubt. Let us pass over unto the other side. And we will come back to that in a moment. But I want you to notice, first of all here, the reality of the storm. The Bible says in verse 37, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. This was not imaginary. This was for real. And the Bible says, it was a great storm. Therefore, it was something that was threatening and filling the disciples with fear. Now, thinking about the reality of the storm that night, there is the suddenness of it. There arose a great storm. Storms, of course, like this, were very, very common on the Sea of Galilee, for the Sea of Galilee is an unusual body of water. It's relatively small. It is said to be 13 miles long, long, 7 miles wide, 150 feet deep, and the shoreline is something like 680 feet below sea level. And because the Sea of Galilee is below sea level and is surrounded by mountains on every side, therefore it would be susceptible to sudden storms. The sea can be calm one moment. The next moment, there can be a violent storm. But those storms did not usually happen by night. So, no doubt, those disciples 
who no doubt would have been seasoned seafaring men, did not set out in a storm. They did not expect a storm, but the storm came. And folks, I don't have to point out to you that that often is the way of life. We can start out a particular day and everything is well and the sun is shining in our hearts and our lives, but as the day unfolds, sometimes the storm clouds gather and before the end of the day, we are in a raging storm. Things can be fine one moment. The next moment, the bottom falls out of our world. One phone call. One visit to the doctor. Turn your world and mine upside down forever. And their world in a moment of time was turned upside down. Yet, folks, that should not surprise us because the Bible reminds us that storms will come our way because in Job chapter 14 and verse 1, the Bible says, man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. In John's gospel chapter 16 and the verse 33, there we read where Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace in the world, ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Storms are part of life, and they are part of the Christian life. Because we're saved by God's grace, we are not immune to the storms of life. This suddenly came upon them. But not only do we see its suddenness, but its severity. Because the Bible says the ship was now full. And these men, though they would have been seafaring men, they are frightened by the severity of the storm. The ship is full of water. They are afraid that this vessel of theirs is going to sink. It was a violent storm, and then it was at night time as well. Now, when the storms of life come, and they are often severe, and they bring pain and anguish, after all, there's the storms of suffering. And when they blow into a believer's life, devastates. And of course, again, we have to remind ourselves that the path of the just is not always a path of sunshine, and no one would choose the path of suffering. But there's many a child of God, and by the way, folks, sickness is not because somebody has sinned. The greatest of God's people have been afflicted by sickness. And there's the storms of sorrow. Someone you love has been called away by death, and it leaves you grief-stricken and shaken by their loss, and sorrow touches every life. But you know, folks, there's something you need to see clearly here, that though the storm was severe, and so it was came up suddenly, and though the disciples were frightened, the good thing is this, that the Lord Jesus Christ was in the boat. He was in the storm with them. He was not disinterested in what they were going through. Storms come, and they bring fear, they bring pain, but we must always remember, folks, that the Lord is in the storm with us. And there is no storm 
And there is no situation that heaven cannot come. There is no problem too great for the Lord Jesus Christ to solve, as there is no sin too great for Him to forgive. But we must always remember that the Lord is in the vessel with us. The disciples seem to forget that. Then there was the source of the storm. Where did this storm come from? We've already said that possibly the Sea of Galilee was susceptible to storms. However, it came at night, and that would have been somewhat rare. Could it be that the Lord Himself allowed the storm? Of course. And that for the purpose of teaching His disciples to trust Him more fully, or the storm could have had a satanic origin. And I say that for a particular purpose, because the devil always sought to destroy the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus calmed the storm, and we read of that in verse 39, and said, be still, that actually is the same word that is translated, hold thy peace, in Mark's gospel, chapter 1 and verse 25. The word means to be muzzled. It has the idea of muzzling a violent animal. And when Jesus used that word in Mark chapter 1 and verse 25, he was using it to command demons to be quiet. To maybe the storm was an attempt, an attack by Satan to destroy the Lord Jesus Christ in that vessel. But every satanic attack against the Savior was doomed to fail. Of course, he tried to kill Jesus on different occasions before Jesus got to the cross. In the storms in our own lives, as believers, can come from various sources too. It goes without saying that some of those storms are our own fault. We do things, we say things that we shouldn't have done and we shouldn't have said, and it brings us into trouble and it destroys our peace. And surely the example of that is Jonah, who tried to run away from the Lord's will. The Bible reminds us all that we reap what we sow. For whatsoever a man, Paul said to the Galatians, a man soweth that shall he also reap. And sometimes, of course, the Lord will send a storm into our life. And that is to discipline us, and that is to draw us closer to Himself. Sometimes He does it to teach us, like He was teaching these disciples, to trust Him more. When God sends a storm, it's always for the purpose of drawing us closer to Him and teaching us to trust Him. You know, folks, storms will come. And they'll make you a better Christian. Well, they'll make you a better Christian. And some Christians have had severe storms and it's made them better. Sometimes, of course, the devil and his attack will send storms. Satan will whip up a storm in your life to defeat you, to drive you away from the Lord, to try to make you believe that the Lord is not really interested. If you're a child of God, you wouldn't be suffering like this. You wouldn't be feeling like this. You wouldn't have the cares of life that you have. And do everything to destroy your faith in Christ. As God's people, we need to realize, folks, we have a real enemy. As some people in our country would need to waken up that we have a real dilemma in this pandemic. And this is a storm. Remember that Jesus said to Peter, Satan has desired to have you. Always remember that, Christian, every day you get up. 
Satan's desiring to have you. That he might sift you as wheat. That he might destroy your testimony. That he might try to destroy your faith in Jesus Christ. But Jesus said, I have prayed for you. But there's not only the reality of the storm here, but then there's the reaction to the storm, because the Bible tells us there, when Jesus said to them, let us pass over unto the other side, and then in verse 38, and he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow, when they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? In other words, you're sleeping and we are perishing. But you know, the greatest storm that night really wasn't on the Sea of Galilee. It was in the hearts of the disciples. Why, the storm on the sea whipped up a storm of doubt, of crippling fear. And often when the storms rage around us, We need to realize that the Lord is not asleep, but is concerned in our situation. And the disciples, they run to the Savior, and they wake him up. These are terrified men. They have lost all hope of ever surviving. But if they'd only remembered what Jesus said, let us pass over unto the other side. Jesus had settled that matter. They were going to the other side. And you know, sometimes the devil will assail a Christian's assurance. And when God saves us by his grace, he doesn't save us to abandon us. He saves us to take us one day to be with himself. And that will happen. No matter what storm arises. And after all, wasn't the Lord there in the vessel with them? And the hymn writer reminds us to take our burden to the Lord and leave it there. Often we pray, and we pray about the storms in our life. We pray about the present circumstances in our life. We pray about the present pandemic in our country and in our world, and almost prayer meetings hardly over to have forgotten what we've asked the Lord about. And if the Lord answered specifically, we'd hardly recognize it as an answer to our prayer. Now, that storm that night, it caused them to doubt God's goodness. They said to him, carest thou not? They accused the Lord of not caring about what they were going through. After all, these very same people they had seen the Savior's compassion. They had witnessed his goodness in action. They had seen him conquer devils. They had seen him heal diseases. They had seen him forgive depravity. Now they are faced with a storm, and their faith is gone. And the problem was there, folks. Like Peter of the day, he walked on water. The moment he took his eyes of the Lord, and onto the water he began to sink. And these men had their eyes on the storm and not on the Lord. Maybe there's times in all of our lives when that has happened. Situations have come into our lives, and they've brought fear. And we question God's concern for us. Now, David, the psalmist, on one occasion uh, did that, for you will recall that he cried out, no man cared for my soul. But the Lord cares. In fact, we read in Hebrews chapter 4 and the verse 15 and 16, 
For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly. Let us come with confidence unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We don't have to doubt God's goodness. They not only doubted God's goodness, they doubted his grace because they said, carest thou not that we perish? You have to remember it was the Lord Jesus Christ who actually sent them out into the sea. It was he who said to them, let us go over unto the other side. These men had left everything to obey the Lord and to follow him, and now they find themselves in this threatening situation. We perish. Again, Christian, God didn't save you to abandon you. And when the days get tough, and the storms of sickness and sorrow flood into your life. You need to remember what he said. I will never leave thee. And I will not forsake thee. For lo, I am with you always, even in the midst of the storm, unto the very end of life. The city of Jerusalem, they felt that they were abandoned by the Lord and that he had forsaken them. But then we read in Isaiah chapter 49, uh, the Lord's response to them. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My God hath forgotten me. He said, can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea. They may forget. Yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have grieved thee on the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. The Lord who loved the nation of Israel, whom he had redeemed out of the land of Egypt and from under the tyranny of the pharaohs, how much more will he love and protect and provide for his own church whom he has redeemed with the blood of his own precious son? There's not one of them who perish in the storm. Through the lips of the Apostle Paul, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And the Apostle Paul therefore said, Most gladly therefore will I glory in mine infirmities. The power of Christ may rest upon me. Jesus said, Let us pass over. Therefore he already told them where he was going. The other side. If they had believed those words, they had no reason to doubt or to fear or to panic. So with you and me, the Lord has promised to give us eternal life, and he has given us eternal life, and no storm and no imp of hell will ever deny you the right of getting to the other side, the glory itself. Let me just conclude, folks, with the reason for the storm. In the verse 39, he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have so little faith? And they feared exceedingly. You see, when they awoke the Lord Jesus Christ out of his sleep, 
They made some very precious discoveries that night. Discoveries that you and I need to be daily reminded of. I believe that they discovered more of His power because they had seen the Lord heal the sick, okay, but here now He's commanding the very winds and the waves, and they obey Him, and they say, what manner of man is this? The storms had so terrified those men, but that posed no problem to the Lord Jesus Christ. He rebuked the sea, and the wind, after all he'd created it, he was in control of it. And folks, we need to understand this. No matter what situation, no matter what pandemic, no matter what problem, Savior's always in control. He never, lo- when you and I lose control, he never loses control. And that is because of his mighty power. And in Matthew 28 and 18, he said, all power, not some power, not most power, not much power, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Your storm and your situation is no problem to Christ. Could I say to someone, maybe you feel in your heart and you're not saved, you're far away from God, God could do nothing for you. Listen, there's no sinner too sinful for him to see. There's no situation that he cannot take control of. That is seen again and again in the Bible. We have the three Hebrew children, and they are cast into the fiery furnace. And of course, that furnace was turned up. And when they looked into the furnace, instead of the three Hebrew children being burned to a cinder, there was four of them in the fire. You see, folks, when you're in the fire, God's in the fire with you. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. Anyone that would go into a lion's den would be ravished to pieces, but the Lord was in the den. He controlled the lion. No matter what our situation is, the Lord is in control. And they discovered more of His power that day, and they discovered more about His promises that day, because Jesus has said, let us pass over. And they passed over. Not one of them was lost. And here's the good news of the gospel. All that Jesus says, not one of them is lost. Of all that thou hast given me, he says, I've lost none. He says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You see, those disciples, though they were fearful, they were as safe and as secure as God can make them. And Christian, you are as safe as God can make you, and sure of heaven. And they came over to the other side, no doubt, because God is good to His Word. He never break His Word. And then they discovered more about His presence. You see, folks, when the Lord is in our lives, we have no real reason to fear. Verse 36 says, there were also with him other little ships. There were many other little boats out on the sea in the storm that night. But only one contained the Savior. Little wonder the hymn writer says, with Christ in the vessel, and smile at the storm. And as you and I sail on the sea of life, we need to be sure that Jesus is in our lives and our vessels as our personal Savior. And folk, if you're here and you're not saved, make sure that you get Christ in your life. 
because while the path of the just groweth more perfect and brighter unto that perfect day, the path of the just, unjust, grows darker. And there is no peace apart from him. The storm that day taught these, uh, that night taught these men a lesson that really could not have been learned any other way. He sent them into the storm to teach them. He would always be with them in the storm. He was always good to his precious word. And they came safely to the other side. It's true. With Christ in the vessel, we can smile at the storm as we go sailing home. But is Christ in your life today? Do you know him as Savior? If not, then can I encourage you to trust him. There will be the reality of storms. There will be a particular reaction to those storms. But we don't have to doubt or fear. Because the reason of those storms is to teach us to discover more of the Lord's power, more about His promises, and more about His presence. And they came to the other side. Let's just bow together for a word of prayer. Our loving God and our eternal Heavenly Father, we thank you indeed for the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is with us in every situation and circumstance of our life. And when the storms rage around us, we thank you for that peace that we can have through trusting in thee. And yet we realize there's many in our world and they have no peace whatsoever. They have no security in the midst of the storm. We pray that you'll help them to Lay hold upon eternal life to trust the Savior and bless all of your people today. We ask, Lord, that we'll get our eyes of circumstances and situations, place them firmly on the Savior, who said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We ask now that you'll separate us with your blessing, cover us neath the precious blood. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit Rest, Rabbeinu, and abide with us this day and forevermore. Amen. <clears throat>